I would like very much for for us to keep our finger on uh, Psalm 90. So if you would do that, uh, that would be wonderful. We will seek to go through this psalm uh, as exhaustively as we possibly can. I'd like to pray before we begin, shall we? <clears throat> Father, who are we that you are mindful of us? And yet, you are, Lord, mindful of us. You call us to your presence. You call us to put our trust in you. You gave your precious Son for us, that we may find life. And so, Father, having found life, you desire our growth, you desire our holiness, you desire our commitment and loyalty to you. And Father, hearing this word would be just another step in our walk toward our dedication and commitment to you. So speak, Lord, as we strive to hear a word from you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Moses is the writer of this psalm. He was at that time about 80 years old. And by then, he had become familiar with the fragility of life. See, in a span of 40 years, he watched 605,550 people die. Now, that, translate to, that translates to about 15,000 people dying a year in the wilderness for the 40 years span there. And that would mean that Moses was conducting 41 funerals a day, but that figure applies only to the men. If you should throw in women and children into the mix, Moses was conducting 87 funerals a day. And that's not the exact number for each day, because some days thousands die in one single day because of their rebellion, because of their sin. You read that in Numbers 16, and you read that again in Numbers 25. The Old Testament scholar Daniel Block says, for 38 years, Moses lived in a walking mortuary. Now, what a bleak experience that is, to have the air, to have the air you breathe fouled with a stench of death every single day for 38 years. And even if the Israelites had mastered the art of embalming the date, learning it from the Egyptians, which is questionable, but even if they did, you are pitting against time and temperature. It's an bl- awful experience, a dreadful experience altogether. Now the background of this psalm is Numbers 20. They're pushing off to the brink of the promised land. They're closing in on the promised land. And uh, in this one single chapter alone, after 38 years of wandering, in this one single chapter alone, Moses sees the death of his own sister, Miriam, and he sees the death of his own brother, Aaron. And when they finally, finally reach the promised land, except for Joshua and Caleb, not one person over the years of 20 years old that Moses had known is alive. Now, how very depressive this must be for Moses. He's now 120 years old. Miriam is gone. Aaron is gone. And Moses is all alone by himself. And he sees acutely that his own days are severely numbered. So he sits down and he writes the only psalm that he would ever write. And this psalm is one of the oldest texts in the entire Bible. And it is the nearest you would ever get to a philosophical discussion of time in the Bible. 
it begins quite abruptly, and this is where I want you to put your finger on the text, verses 1 and 2. Quite abruptly, he starts talking about generations past. He says, you have been our dwelling place for all generations. And then he backtracks to when the mountains were formed. Now, mountains seem to be timeless and imperishable in our eyes, and yet God predates those lofty mountain ranges. And then he backtracks even further back in time to when the earth was birthed. Look at verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world. But the thing is this, he finally, he finally takes one huge strident step backwards in time to timelessness. He says, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now Moses isn't the first. He isn't the first to contemplate on the uh, eternity of God. Job, far older than Moses, Job was probably the first person to contemplate on the etern eternity of God. He says, Behold, God is great, and we know him not, and the number of his years is unsearchable. That's Job 36, 26. Now, there are heaps of affirmations in Scripture on the eternity of God. I just want to pick up three of them. Isaiah says, God inhabits eternity. Sweet two little words there. God inhabits eternity. That's Isaiah 57, 15. And the psalmist says, The Lord is enthroned forever. His years have no end. That's Psalm 102. And Habakkuk, or Habakkuk says, O oh Lord, are you not from the beginning? Are you not from forever? Are you not from everlasting? See, God never came into existence. There never was a time when God came into existence because if there was such a time, then He's not infinite. He would be contingent. He would be a dependent being. He would be finite. And then you scratch your head and say, perhaps if He never came into existence, perhaps, perhaps He birthed Himself into existence at one point in time. Now, a self calls cause is a contradiction in terms, isn't it? It's an absurd proposition because to cause yourself to come into existence, you have to exist first to generate that cause. So that's an absurd proposition. God has always been. He never had a beginning and He will never have an end. He predates time and He will outrun time. Time has had a beginning and there will come a day when God will take time and fold it up like a blanket and tuck it away. And time will be no more. But eternity is a dimension all by itself. And I don't pretend to understand eternity. It is not simply time forevermore going on and on and on. It's far more than that, far more complex than that. Uh, yeah. Time has no bound on God. He's above the tyranny of time. He's above the ravages of time. He's above the dictates of time. Tozer says God dwells in eternity, but time dwells in God. That's beautiful. God is not subjected to time the way you and I are. Yesterday is not past for God as it is for us. Tomorrow is not future for God as it is for us. God does not live through events sequentially like us. We have a past, we have a present, and hopefully we shall have a future. So we live in between an unchangeable past and an unknowable future. But there is no chronological or chronological succession of, of uh, time, of moments with God. The medieval philosophers rightly understood God, that with God, the past, the present, and the future are, are all merged into one single eternal moment. And I think they are right. 
So in one broad sweep, God sees the end from the beginning. Now, as soon as Moses contemplates on the eternity of God, he contrasts God's eternity with human brevity and human frailty. So quite abruptly, verse 3 stares us in the face. Quite suddenly, you return man to dust. For a thousand years in your sight are as yesterday when it is past. Now, no one knows why Moses should come up with a figure of a thousand. Maybe he was thinking of the oldest living human, and that is Methuselah, who lived 969 years, close enough. It's as if Moses was saying, even if you live to a thousand, it would be like a day in the eyes of God. Now, as if to drive the point home, Moses piles up one analogy after another, after another, one metaphor after another, after another. Look at verse 5. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream. Now, why does he say you sweep them away like a flood? Remember Moses saw with his own eyes thousands of Egyptians swept away by the flood. And so he says in verse 5 and 6, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and it is renewed, but in the evening it fades and withers. Terrible. Of all things that God could compare us with, how undignified that we should be compared to grass. Well, at least compare us to an oak. All right, if not an oak, at least a cedar or pine, all right? But no, he's not going to do that for you. He compares you to, to grass. Verse 6, in the morning it flourishes, it is renewed, and in the ev- evening it fades and withers. Some of you have read the writings of Thomas Howard. He's the brother of Elizabeth Elliot. He says, look at that little stubby wooden pencil on your desk. That little thingy. Let that little thingy that sits on your table, that stubby little pencil, it's going to outlast you. When you're dead and gone, it's still going to be lying there quietly. It's going to outlive you. He makes this point to show the brevity of human existence. God does not promise us a long life. He does not. Well, I've lived enough to be able in the last 40 years to compile a list of fine Christian men and women, leaders and missionaries who died young. Peter Marshall, 47. Paul Little, 46. Oswald Chambers, 43. Eric Little, 43. Bonhoeffer, 39. Flannery O'Connor, 39. Nabil Qureshi, 34. Henry Martin, 32. Nate Saint, 32. David Brennett, 29. Robert Murray McShine, 29. Keith Green, 28, Jim Elliott, 28, William Borden, 25, and if we may include Joan of Arc, 19. You see, we live under the illusion of immortality, but the Bible does not spare us from the stark reality of the brevity of life. Psalms 39, you have made my days like a few hand breath. Now this is one hand breath. You have made my days like a few hand breaths, says the psalmist. My life is nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. And Job 7 says, my days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. 
So how much time do we have? The Bible is blunt. Look at verse 10. 70. 70 is the milestone marker. If you have the strength, 80. Now, this raises very deep, serious questions, existential questions. Why? Why must we die? Why is it that we've got to die? This is the first question of philosophy. It is right here that most philosophical thoughts begin. So why must we die and why is life so short? Moses gives us the answer in a most simple way. He says we must all die because God is angry. It's as simple as that. We must all die because God is angry. Our mortality is the result of God's anger against sin. Ezekiel puts it very bluntly, the soul that sins, it shall die. Paul says the wages of sin is death. Five times from verses 11, 7 to 11, Moses talks about the wrath of God. Look at verse 7, almost brutal. We are brought to an end by your anger, by your wrath. We are dismayed. And our condition is made worse by the fact that we have nowhere to hide. Look at verse 9, or rather verse 8. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. God reveals what we seek so hard to hide. And verse 9 is like adding salt to wound. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finished our years with a groan. We finished our years with a groan. Perhaps the best commentary to this is Romans 1.18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Furthermore, the Bible attributes every single death to the hand of God. Whenever a person dies, it is God who takes him or her away. The summons comes from him. The subpoena is issued by him. Moses makes sure that we get it. Look at verse 5. You sweep man away like a flood. And verse 3. You turn man into dust. Literally, you crush him to dust. The sovereignty of God over death is taught everywhere in the Bible, if you care to search for it. A few examples, 1 Samuel 2, 9, 2, 6, rather, the Lord brings death, the Lord makes alive, he brings down to the grave, he raises up. All the Lord's doing. And Deuteronomy 32, there is no God besides me, it is I who put to death, and it is I who gives life. Scripture is explicit. God spares life, God takes away life. Now let's not forget that it was Moses who wrote the book of Genesis. And there he wrote these words, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The sobering reality is this. God takes away life every single day, even as I stand here and speak. 56 million lives he turns to dust in a year. He takes about 155,000 lives before sun sets this evening. He will take away about seven to 8,000 lives the whole time we are here this morning. And he will take away 3,000 lives from the time I start to the time I finish. And whenever God takes away a life, he does no one no wrong, whether he takes it at 8 or 78. So we are here, and this is our lot. 
in contrast to God's eternity, in contrast to the fact that God is eternal, we are ephemeral. We have only a short fugitive years here on earth. The question is this, why would the Bible even carry a psalm like that? To make us miserable? <laughs> no. To drive us to seek God. There's only one reason why this psalm is here. How do we know? Because even as Moses sat down and wrote this psalm, he himself found himself turning to God. This psalm is meant to turn us to God. And he turns to God and he prays three prayers. Verse 12, prays for wisdom. Verse 14, he prays for satisfaction. And verse 16, he prays for ultimate deliverance. But all three prayers could be summed up in one prayer. Lord, have pity, have mercy on us. Okay, Moses asks for mercy in two ways. Firstly, he asks God for mercy to teach us to number our days. He says, Lord, teach us to number our days so that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Now, Moses is not asking us to count our days. You can't count what doesn't have a set number. The best way to translate teach us to number our days is to translate it this way. Lord, teach us that our days are numbered. Isn't that a better way to put it? Lord, teach us that our days are numbered. And so, so that we may get a heart of wisdom. You know, what a, what, you know what's a heart of wisdom here? The heart of wisdom here is knowing you are grass. That's it. Knowing you are grass is the heart of wisdom. All right. Let me explain what it means to number our days. When Paul was reaching the close of his life, he wrote a little letter to Timothy. He was in Rome then. He wrote a letter to, to, to Timothy, and he says to Timothy, do your best to come to me. And then he didn't put a full stop there. He adds this phrase, come before winter. You could almost feel the pulse of Paul's heartbeat in that little line, come before winter. Why, be why before winter? Because in the Mediterranean, when winter sets in, the season of navigation closed and no ship would dare venture out. If Timothy waited until winter, he would have to wait until spring. And by then, Paul would probably have died. Because Paul had this premonition that he would not outlast the winter. He wrote us a little note, and we have it here. He says, I'm already at the point of being sacrificed. The time of my departure has come. You know, many of us love the season of autumn. It's a beautiful, exquisite, exquisitely beautiful season. But how quickly autumn passes. One day, the forests are ablaze in all its splendor. The trees are radiant with yellow and gold and red. And the next day, the rain will fall and the winds will howl. In one single day, the trees could be stripped of all its beauty. You see, the season of autumn is a perfect but sad parable of all that is beautiful but brief. In 1915, Clarence McCartney, the Presbyterian minister, preached a sermon called Come Before Winter. In it, he says, there are gates wide open on this autumn day, but next October they will be forever shut. There are tides of opportunities running now at a flood, but next October they will be running at an ebb. There are voices speaking, pleading with us so earnestly today, but a year from today, they will be forever silent. 
There are things we ought to do, words we ought to speak, long before the long days of summer turns short and cold, before the hearts turn cold and life is over. Sobering thoughts, those are really. In August 2003, the transcripts of messages to and from the authority of the New York Port of Authority on September 11 was finally released. Now those are transcripts, transcripts of actual phone conversations between people who were caught up in the World Trade Center and those people who are very dear to them. Most of this call came from people who never made it because by then the stairwells were filled with smoke and the elevators were all jammed. And many of these calls were agonizingly heart-rending. You don't want to listen to them. You hear people frantically saying their goodbyes, words which should long, long ago have been spoken, but have been withheld until that moment. James says you do not know what tomorrow will hold. You're a mist that appears in the morning, but by midday it is gone. You want the best commentary on that verse? Turn to the, turn to the obituary column of your daily newspaper. That's the best commentary on James 4. We need God's mercy to teach us to number our days. People who know their days are numbered do not spend their years chasing after the wind. They do not flirt with trash and trivia. They do not fool around with froth and bubble. They know that they are mayflies. I've said this before sometime in, others, in another sermon that I used to do fly fishing, which I don't do now. But one of my favorite flies to tie is the mayfly. It just works <laughs> nearly all the time. It's very deceptive to trout. But the mayfly belongs to a species that's called ephemeral. Well, it's ephemeral. It's, it, it lasts shorter than 24 hours. It's not, it does not live longer than that. And that's, that's really what we are. And to know that our days are numbered is to realize that we are ephemeral. If you knew for sure that you have two more years to live, what would you do that you are not doing right now? For you do not know that you do, do not have that, that you do have that two years time to live. Kevin De Jong asks, what little annoyances would you let go of? What projects would you stop pursuing? What priorities would you start to make them real priorities? What people would you try to spend more time with? Numbering our days is an invitation to think more seriously about eternity. So that's the first way Moses asks for mercy. Teach us to number our days. There is a second way that Moses seeks God to show him mercy. Verse 13, return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. And verse 16, let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Now what exactly is he praying for when he says, let your work be shown to your servants? That phrase, your work, refers ultimately to the great work of redemption by the Messiah. Certainly, certain not, certainly not within the purview of Moses at that time, at that point in time. In short, it's a prayer expressing a longing for the promised Messiah. Remember this psalm was written in the midst of people dying everywhere? It's a prayer that death be put to death. It's a prayer that the curse of Genesis be reversed. But isn't that the longing of every human heart, that death be put to death? That we not have to die anymore, ever? 
You see, there is an arrogant bravado out there that says death is no big deal. People like Voltaire, Bertrand Russell, Christopher Hitchens, they will brazenly tell you that death is no big deal. And it was Bertrand Russell who says, when you die, the maggots take over. That's all, nothing more. No life, no consciousness, no personality after death. Really? Really? Recently, Tim Keller reminded us that when you say that, you are hardening, you are squashing, you are killing a part of the heart's hope that makes you human. You see, if there is no creator, if there is nothing beyond death, nothing, completely darkness and nothing else at all, then when you fall in love, when, or when you feel so much love for the one you love, like your mother or your children, then what you are feeling is merely a psychopharmacological firing in your brain. That's all. It's nothing real. There's no reality. There is no such thing as love. There's no such thing as beauty. There's no such thing as joy. Those are mere biological reactions in your brain, synapses, that goes firing in your brain from time to time. If that is true, if that is true, then Richard, Richard Dawkins is right. DNA neither cares nor knows. DNA just is, and we dance to its tune. How pathetic. How pathetic is that a philosophy to live a life on? But we do have real tangible feelings of love. And when someone we love passes on, there is this deep existential longing that never dies, that hope that you will see her again, that you will be with her again, that you could kiss her again, you can embrace her again and talk to her again. Where is this coming from? God couldn't have given us all this love just to have it extinguished. So instinctively, we know that this life cannot be all there is to it. Our hearts cry out to not to have to die, but to go on living. And we look forward to a day when life is no longer molested by death. Looking back, I'm so glad that God delivered me from Buddhism. Because I was taught that I was merely Atman, an impersonal force. And because of my advia, my ignorance, I suffer from maya, illusion. And because of that, I've got to come around after this life is over in another life form. And so I will go through a series of reincarnation from one life form to another until finally my karmic debt has all been paid off. And then I will attain to moksha, or samsara, and finally to nirvana, ultimate bliss. But the point is this, when that day happens and I attain to ultimate nirvana, I would be like a candle <sighs> snuffed out. I would be like a drop of water returning to the ocean. I would be like a potter's wheel slowly grinding to a halt. I'm so glad I was delivered from that. Oh, I don't want that. I don't want to be a drop of water returning to the ocean where my personality is merged with um and nothing else. No more reality, no more Andrew. No more my loved one whom I so long to see again. No more. How could that be? My heart cries within me to want to live on as me. We repulse at the thought of total annihilation. We want to be able to go on loving people who are dearest to us. We all long to live, to, to, to live eternally. It's a homing beacon that's built somewhere within us. It, it's God who put it there. How do I know? Well, Book of Solomon says, God has planted eternity in our hearts. Ecclesiastes 3.11 Do you know that Moses' prayer that he sees the Redeemer is answered? <laughs> How do we know? Luke chapter 8 Jesus is up on the mountain. He is in bright 
apparel, and he's talking to two people. <laughs> one of them is Elijah, and the other one is Moses. Moses came back. Moses saw the Redeemer. But the greatest news is this. God has shown us mercy by satisfying our heart's cry for eternity. That's been answered. Our cry for eternity has been answered. How so? Well, let me put it this way. For all the talk about the wrath of God, not a single person has ever faced the wrath of God. Well, to be sure, we, we're going to face, or all human people without Christ, they're going to face the oncoming wrath of God when they breathe their last breath. But so far, no one has felt the wrath of God. That's why Moses throws verse 11 in. Who knows the power of your anger? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is no one. But Moses was a man of his time. We know something he didn't. We know of one man. We know of one man who finally felt the wrath of God who knew the power of God's anger, his son, Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse himself. One man, at least on this earth, has faced the wrath of God full frontal. On the cross, our sins were lumped onto his fair head, imputed to him, and he absorbed the full brunt of God's wrath. He was totally forsaken. He was totally abandoned. He descended into hell so that we may ascend into heaven. He died so that we may inhabit eternity. You see, seen in the larger context, this entire psalm is a prayer that the curse of Genesis be reversed. That prayer established the work of our hands. What is the ultimate curse? The curse of your hands. The work of your hands. Everything you touch turns into dust after the fall. You will toil with the sweat of your brow just to come up with a few pathetic loaves of bread. The toil of labor. So when he says establish the work of our hands, he's asking that that great curse of Genesis be turned around and our hands now find fruitful work. And that is ultimately restored when we have life eternal. I want to close with these words. If the mother of all fears is the fear of death, here is someone who has dealt decisively with that predicament. In Christ, your death has died. And you can trash talk your death. You can trash talk your grave. Like Paul, you can say, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? In Christ, you do not have 70 or 80 pathetic, miserable years. In Christ, you have the joy of life eternal. In Christ, your story does not end in a veil of tears. In Christ, your story ends with, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In Christ, at the point when you breathe your last breath, you're not a candle snuffed out. You're not a drop of water returning to the ocean. You are journeying your way to the new Jerusalem. You're a new creation heading towards an imperishable inheritance to the praise of His glory. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, have pity on us. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Help us to be grateful for a Saviour who descended to hell so that we may be raised to glory. Amen. Amen.